everybody. This is the Coffee with the Geek program. It's April of 2021. Always moving forward. A great time. With me today is, this is going to be the second time I've interviewed somebody that I've interviewed in the past. So it's going to be a, hopefully a really good catch-up interview. Uh, my guest today is John Redeker. And if you're on Twitter, you probably know John well. If you're an educator, uh, John is a great person to follow, posts tons of stuff, relevant, good, up to speed, uh, neat ideas and good stuff. So, uh, John, thank you so much for joining me, a fellow New York educator, as well as an Ithaca grad. I shouldn't have. I hope I didn't steal your thunder. All good. Um, but first, let's get to the most important question of the day, which is, are you a coffee drinker and uh, what's your favorite blend? So I am a coffee drinker. I have it with me here. Um, I love a dark roast um, and no additives, dark, black, just plain coffee. And uh, I could drink it all day. So I uh, <laughs> wow. need to scale back a little bit on that, but I also like to brand my stuff. So I've got this, uh, you might've seen this in a different saying, but I put stickers all over my things, but sometimes you see this, this slogan, uh, here's one, a former superintendent, a friend of mine, uh, tragic end of his life, but he had make someone's day today was his mantra. Um, got a couple others here. I love this. Live a great story. So some nice reminders here as I'm sipping on my coffee cup throughout the day. Nice. So, besides the coffee, have some inspiration with it too. <laughs> well, you know, that's what I like about you, John. And I think it shows in your Twitter uh, feed as well that you've got a pretty positive, optimistic outlook. And uh, I think that's, I think we all need that, especially in trying times that we've, we've gone through, especially for this year. Yeah. Uh, so tell me, let's just, probably the question I ask uh, most often is just your educational journey. And I like this question because it kind of gives everyone a framework of where you've been and, and where you're going. So uh, tell us about your past. Tell us about education. What got you into education? Maybe some of your inspirations. Uh, let's, let's start there. I love these talks and, and starting like that. It's also actually it's so funny. I also always love um, open house because I would talk about these things with parents and it gets me excited to talk about <laughs> why we do what we do and what, what drives us. I'm not just like going through a content calendar or something like that, you know, right. um, so this is great. Um, I uh, started out, um, I moved to this area in Orange County, New York, um, just north of New York City, about an hour drive. Um, I think the sign on the highway says 57 miles to Manhattan. Uh, from here so um pretty close to that by the way home of uh Le legoland new york here in goshen new york so that's opening this summer apparently cool. uh, which is kind of crazy to think about a massive theme park right here in town um <laughs> but uh anyway uh, i i moved to the area when my wife got a job we both were ed educators certified in new york state i don't know if you know about the state it's difficult if you have a new york certification to go out of the state it's very kind of prescriptive it's not very re reciprocal to other states sometimes so both of us grew up out of state, um, but we ended up going, going to college at Ithaca, getting our degrees. And then we um, got married right out of school and moved to this area. And it's interesting because I was unemployed for some time and I was just doing some substitute teaching. And uh, I was you know, a bunch of schools, like a lot of people do to get started. And um, I was teaching at, substitute teaching at Goshen High School and there was a, a tragic um, death uh, had occurred at, a, at our middle school. A beloved teacher had died in a car accident and um, over like Thanksgiving break, I think. And um, I was able to, they, they put me down in her job basically um, that year. So I don't even know if I actually interviewed for it. No, I'm just, <laughs> just going to happen. <laughs> um, but, but it was interesting because I was 22 years old, um, just, you know, still fresh out of college, you know, didn't know much. And I had to grow up really fast because you know, and mature quickly to deal with. Um, they had this tragic loss in their lives, these kids and the faculty and everything. And it was a tough, tough year. Um, but it really started to ground me and I helped to grow really quickly in that, in that regard. Um, I ended up with um, one of those classrooms at the time, this is the early 2000s, uh, where I believe it was the only room in the school or maybe one of them at the middle school's eighth grade social studies, which is my certification area uh, out of college. And I was teaching um, and there was a smart board on wheels and the projector was on wheels. So I don't know if you guys remember <laughs> that, but like, you know, orienting the smart board is always like a thing. But like when both are on wheels, it's insane. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy. So and, and the idea was like it would be shared. You moved into classrooms and stuff. But but I, basically I inherited a space with this and nobody saw the need to like keep moving this thing back and forth. So I basically used it. And my journey into like instructional technology happens basically organically in that moment. In those first few years of my, of my teaching, 
I just decided like, I'm gonna use these tools. Um, and then uh, my room was near the computer lab. And so we ended up like using a lot of those resources and those folks to help out as well. Um, in the meantime, as I was teaching, of course, you have to get your master's. I went to New York Institute of Technology and I uh, did my master's in um, instructional technology, um, where at that point I also um, did the certification as well. Right? A lot of people get the degree, but don't get certified. So I took the New York State test to be a certified instructional technology specialist, um, which I just had in my pocket, never really like used for my employment. Um, and then from there, I spent, uh, it was eight years at the middle school, um, and I was doing things organically. Um, eventually, it was like the recession, they cut some positions, they cut some technology, and we started to build back. Um, I eventually connected with our, one of our assistant superintendents and said, hey, like, I'm doing a lot of work. You're sending me to a lot of conferences because I've been the go-to guy for instructional tech. Can I, can we make something more of this? So we made an organic position. I think it was like a little, like a coaching level stipend to do some of the extra work and coordination. Did my, another master's degree in um, instructional leadership online through a college out of state, which I didn't realize would be trouble with reciprocity and New York State again. But um, anyway, I did that and, and wrote our first tech plan, uh, wrote and had some vision and started to guide from a, small, a young teacher into really starting to create some vision. Give me one second. What's up, buddy? Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> That's my okay. My kid's like sitting next to me trying to get my attention. <laughs> so, so then we ended up with um, the sort of like, instead of being like this young guy at a college playing with technology, I was like writing vision plans for a district, right? So that became sort of a, a launch pad. Um, and in year eight uh, of my career, um, they looked at a move that they wanted to make and they said, look, you know, we see value in this district for what you're doing, for helping lead us. Um, we want you to come switch over to Goshen High School and teach the same thing, teach social studies, which is what I was still doing, but also um, we'll just teach part-time. So instead of teaching like five classes a day at a high school, we'll teach three classes. You'll have no, no duty, no study hall, no lunch duty. Um, and then the rest of your time, you can go and be our tech coordinator around the district. So that happened for about seven years. And um, it was great, but it was a lot. You know, I started, we started to implement STEAM programs. We started to bring on Project Lead the Way at our elementary school. We started to build a STEAM wing in our high school. And, and we started to do much more with technology. We, you know, Chromebooks hit the, hit the stage and how to, all the Google certification stuff. And so uh, it was just actually the 2019, the fall of 2019, right before, you know, this whole pandemic and everything, the, the central administration, the Board of Education said, hey, you know what, we really want you to be full time in instructional technology. So I was doing it part-time for so long um, that it, it was just a natural flip. They just had to get some people to cover the classes that I was assigned to, uh, which was a hard break um, to be honest. But the timing was like so necessary because then when the pandemic struck and we shut down schools in March of 2020, I mean, it just, it just became a necessity. I mean, I, I worked we call it in our area, we have uh, a friend of mine, Dana Castine, who's also involved with um, a couple of the organizations I'm involved with as well. Uh, she, she made these stickers that said 25-8, because instead of 24-7, that's how we all felt during the, especially the early parts of the mm. pandemic, that we were all working 25-8, answering emails and questions and everything. Um, so it's kind of funny to be out of the classroom now, but uh, this is now my 16th year in the same district. Um, I've had incredible opportunities to be um, in leadership roles, both in the district and as well as with some state level and national level organizations. Uh, you and I are both involved in, with the NiceGate organization. Um, this year, I had the opportunity to join the um, Future Ready Schools initiative. Um, that uh, So I'm a thought leader in their instructional technology strand. Um, I've been able to present at, at a conference in Indiana and do a couple of different things to share some of my ideas and my vision. And it's really important to me to understand that, um, you know, I'm not the, the I'm not the hardware guy. I have a guy who does that. My, my colleague Jim is great. <laughs> Just got off the phone with them. He'd he'd be the guy pulling cables through the ceiling and you know fixing the hardware on the device you're using. But I work a lot with the instructional side. Um, but my focus is always when we work with the instructional side that we're dealing with with people, right? We're not dealing with computers. We're dealing with computers to get to people. And so my whole focus has been about creating understanding, creating empathy. Um, and I think I've been talking about some of those things way before this social emotional learning became a, a tagline, you know, a phrase in our schools. Um, and so in talking about how we connect with kids, I've been thinking about that for a long time. One of the metaphors I like to use when I, when I talk to people is, you know, sometimes people think like these are, are bad, right? Cell phones and, and the connectivity, but 
I go, literally the, the operating system that most of you are using is, is called Windows. Nobody thinks Windows are bad, right? Windows are open to the world or they let I, things in, right? It's a portal. And if we can use that portal well, it's not the black mirror as, a la the Netflix series of technology being so dark and, and dooming, we can actually use it um, to leverage some positive things. So that's sort of what I, my hope is as we work towards um, the future and current use of instructional technology and supporting teachers as well. You know, as you were talking about your first experiences with the smart board, it made me realize, and this is not a criticism of, of smart or the board in general, but uh, it, that seems like that was one of the earliest technologies that kind of exposed whether you were a make it or a break it kind of teacher. Yeah. You know, I mean, how many smart boards were left underutilized, you know, or were, were glorified just projector screens. And it's such a powerful board, you know, it yeah. really is. If, if you know how to use it, it, you really could do some amazing stuff with that. And that is to this day. And there's absolutely, uh, yeah, there's, and listen, so there's, there's still a great place. I mean, for, some of the basic like hey you need this information here it is let's share it obviously if you can put it on a kid's screen in front of them that's helpful too but um i think there's a move by some educators and thought leaders to sort of move away from sort of having like a board to look at things but i mean it's helpful in a lot of ways right it's just mm -hmm. that we don't need to be stuck to it all the time um and that being said you know I, i'll be the first to knock like the traditional lecture as far as you know, just overdoing it and overkill, but there's a place for it. And it can be done well with project-based learning and with these other tech-based initiatives or other things. But um, my favorite, you know, some of my favorite teachers are the ones who not only did our projects and hands-on stuff, but could just tell a good story. You know, like mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a lecture, but maybe a storytelling, you know, especially in the, in the liberal arts, perhaps more than other, uh, maybe the, more than the math and science departments. But um it's great, you know, to think about some of those things. But I just had a great conversation this morning with a teacher asking like, hey, how do I move my, you know, fourth quarter research paper project to become more of a project-based learning open-ended thing? And so that's not really technology, but that's my, my, my heart and my passion takes me into those worlds too, because this is just a tool that was, I'm sitting in front of. It's not, it's not the end-all be-all. So can we use that well for better teaching? Um, I don't know if that, that job title or position is defined in the way I think about it. You know, if I'm an instructional technology coordinator, I also want to be a thought leader. So if I were to ever be able to design my own title as a position in a district, um, it, it would be, what was, I came up with it recently, it was the um, a director of innovation and technology. Um, and so that would be something that would be, you know, that, that focus of innovation of best practices. Um, and, I, and I put it on my website, my Twitter handle and stuff, but I like, we always use that, those catchphrases in education. And it was, you know, always best practice, best practice. And I always think like, let's go from best practice to next practice. And so like, just let's move forward and think about what's coming up next. Oh, you, you, you springboarded a bunch of ideas <laughs> off me with that one. Um, one of them being, you know, just in your role as working with teachers and I've seen it, or maybe you haven't seen it, but let me bounce this off of you. I felt like, especially in the pandemic, when teachers were needing to use Zoom, I saw real fear on teachers' faces about using technology. Uh, you know, some teachers that just had resisted technology for a long time, and here they were being thrown into it. And uh, I, I saw panic on people's faces. And tell me about how you kind of if that's your experience as well and how you kind of work through to get people, um, you know, teachers to, to feel that, that comfort level. Cause I think that was a big challenge. Yeah. And I'll be honest there, you know, people still had to want it. They still had to want the support. Um, and I think they saw the need, but some people were able to sort of skirt by and, and sort of figure it out. Um, so in the early part of the pandemic without much guidance from state ed and local school districts and stuff, right? People sort of did things differently. Some people had lots of meetings virtually. Some people had minimal or just posted things on their learning management software or whatever. Um, but I know really like a big, I was helping a, a one woman um, who was uh, later in her career um, and she had resisted technology for a long time. Great teacher, but resisted technology for a long time. And I love this because uh, she wanted to do a read aloud with her elementary school students and she wanted to have her dog with her and things like that. She's asking questions about it. So we hopped on a, on a meet together. Um, we weren't using Zoom in our district, but we were hopping on a meet and um, we 
connected and uh, her husband, she had her husband sit right off camera with her so he could watch and take notes so that she had someone to go back to. Like, I thought that was great. Like, they're just they're at home and the, the dog is in the back, <laughs> and she's, like ready to plan a lesson or something for the next day. And she's just like, I, I just need him here. And I was like, that's <laughs> awesome. Like you're yeah. asking for him in your house. Um, and I think that's really cool. Um, I think that often as teachers, like we're resistant to ask for help for things because we have been the helpers, right? We answer questions for students. We answer, we do that. We're the providers in that, in that regard. And in many ways in our own homes, right? With our families and stuff too. So I think that's, that's challenging. The, the bigger issue came for me, I love that example of that one teacher who, who asked for help like that. But the bigger issue is when you have, uh, we got to September and the guidance kept changing and you know people wanted to know what to prepare for and what lessons are gonna be like. And even now guidance changed on Friday. Our school districts in our area had plans totally ripped out from them because of the guidance that changed from the state on, on Friday. So in thinking about that, it just becomes so challenging to know like uh, what the best use of the technology is um, and so the, the best case that I see is when, when the teachers are just able to use it to connect with kids. Um, and so even if it's a private meet or a small group or a breakout or whatever it might be to connect with them, assign your, your work can be asynchronous. Your work can be, you know, go, go and do, right? Go out or, and come back. But in the meantime, let's talk with kids individually. They may not want to be turning their cameras on in, you know, a full group setting of 30 kids on, on a screen. And it's frustrating. It really stinks to talk to little icons and, and name placards and stuff with nobody behind the, the wall there. I do webinars like that sometimes, but I get it. Teachers are busy. And <laughs> right. They have to multitask too. But if that's what you're doing every day, it's you don't get to know kids and stuff. So it's, I encourage people to just schedule time, you know, and, and get to know them and see what their struggles are and ask a conversation. I, I heard a teacher yesterday who was just struggling with engagement. He has a student teacher too. I mean, what a time to be student teaching. This is crazy to, to learn, you know, the basics here. But he was just, they were going through their list of kids and just calling and just checking in. Uh, it was after school, just calling these kids on, on meets, having them log in. They scheduled it and said, I need you to log in. I need you to check in. And it's like, yeah, what's going on? Like, I haven't seen you. I haven't heard from you. I want to get to know you. And they started to, and it wasn't like, hey, you need to turn your camera on. It's like, hey, we need to do this together. We're on the same team. Um, so those have been great. Um, Right now, I think teachers are burnt out. Uh, teachers don't want more training. They might need it. And certainly a lot of districts um, put in like, you know, tons of resources that they would love to be used and, and softwares that we purchased and things like that. And they're going to wonder like, hey, did we use this this year? Was this fiscally smart? Frankly, you can't really have those conversations right now because the teachers have, have continued to struggle. We're still in a crisis moment in this pandemic, even though we see some light at the end of the tunnel, perhaps with vaccines and stuff, we're still in a crisis moment. So when we come, if whatever the rest of this year looks like and next year, um, I would actually encourage people to start to lay off the technology, even um, the beginning, whenever things can re resume in some regard to normal. Um, let's like bring kids in to school and like get out the glue and the scissors and like, you know, make stuff together or the 3D printer, whatever, like at the uh -huh. levels you're at. But let's make stuff together. Let's talk face to face. Let's engage with each other. And then, you know, in a couple of months, once we do some of that, or as we do that, we have a conversation about what worked well in the past and what didn't. You know, virtual meetings are going to be great. I'd love if as a classroom teacher to not schlep all the way down to like a main office for like a 504 or like IEP meeting to go over with a parent. Listen, we got to do it. We have to meet. That's very important. But if I can sit here and, and still have like my stuff with me and not have to take the trip and waste my time and whatever, I can still connect with you on a personal level. Um, some of these things are going to be good to keep, um, but I don't think we can force that right right away. That, that it's we're still in a crisis moment, and that's that's not the time to initiate new changes or to move forward. It's the time to help. And so I've been very hesitant to push initiatives. I've just offered solutions, and if they didn't use solutions, that's fine um, for this year. You know, we can talk about what that looks like in the future. I think that's really well put. Really well put, and I liked how you made the distinction. Uh, right at the beginning of that question of, uh, you know, this is a traditional teacher and a great teacher, you know, you don't have to use technology to be a great teacher. <laughs> and I, and I, I always kind of, you know, I, I always worry that I'm, I'm kind of making that underlying statement and, and I'm not. And I think I, I've seen amazing teachers and, you know, it was, it was that struggle for them to use a different medium. It's almost like asking, you know, 
an artist who uses oils and canvas to to go and create a sculpture you know That's they're not hobby. they're not exactly the same <laughs> thing you have right. a creative brain for it but do you have to learn learn the process so yeah and i think i think the one caveat that i, I would want to add is that you know I, I agree completely you don't have to be a great you know into technology to, to be a great teacher but i think what school districts at large across the state across the nation probably do need to do is sit down and, and really uh, codify what skills kids need for technology so you might not be the best at it you may need to elicit some support from a teacher across the hall or, or somebody a specialist in some way like a tech person to come and work with your students but if we're going to talk about basic skills of how to research how to use a google search how to um, do some basic coding like if there are skills that we're looking for we need to codify that and find solutions for teachers that are less ready to, to teach it on their own, but to integrate with others to pull that in there. Because we do see gaps in, in our students and say, oh, you had this teacher last year. So you know this, but you might've had this teacher last year and you're here, you know, on a skill. And it can happen in any topic, you know, math, science, social studies, literacy, but we need to really be talking about how, to, how we become fluent with technology. Um, and there's a great website. I think it's like the, the five digital fluencies. Let me look it up so I can make sure I, I make a reference for that. But okay. Uh, but I like I like how they talk about these things. Um, and I'm not finding it quickly, but that's okay. Okay. Uh, while you're looking for it, um, let's talk about probably your and my favorite educational organization, or at least one of them, top five for sure. <laughs> right, top top one for both of us, I think. Let's Absolutely. let's not kid each other. Uh, nice gate which is uh, the ISTE affiliate of uh, Educational Technology in New York. And we're, we're part of the planning committee. And uh, it's just a great organization with great people. And I think both of us would agree that it's enhanced our careers uh, just through the connections and the great people that are part of it. Uh, tell me about NiceGate, your role in NiceGate and social media. You're the social media chair and you, done a, you do a lot with just connecting people there. Talk about that and, and even, you know, talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of social media these days. Yeah. And you've got the little banner behind you, which is great. The nice <laughs> yes, cape. my cape. I just have my siding for my uh, <laughs> picture. Um, but it's nice day out, so I'm not sitting outside. Um, but I, I, yeah, nice kid has been great to me and, and professionally and personally as well. One of the things I'll just highlight, first of all, that fits right in my mantra for what I talk about at, at my own district and everything, but. You know, the, the CEO and the board of directors from Icegate, they're, they're big about family first. You know, so you might volunteer and have, any, um, you know, a role to play. But if there's something that you need to prioritize in your family, whether it's a tragedy or a celebration of some kind or whatever, and you can't do something, they are always understand, understanding of all their volunteers and their staff and saying, look, it's family first, make that a priority. And, and in that way, Icegate has become part of a family too, right? Because they, they, they value that and they buy in, which is great. So I love that. And Amy uh, Del Corvo just leads in that so, so well, which is great. She does. Um, so uh, yeah, a number of, I was attending NiceGate. Uh, I actually think I won a grant to go to NiceGate. There was some sort of local conference I went to when I was just starting out in sort of my educational technology pathway. And I, I got an access to a free NiceGate registration hotel, whatever. And I was like, yeah. And I knew nobody up there in Rochester for this <laughs> event. I had not really been involved in NiceGate before. This was probably like maybe, I don't know, 2008, 9, 10, somewhere in there. And uh, I said, um, I went once and then, you know, the district decided like, hey, we don't really have money to send you every year, but I continue to be involved and see what's happening. And then I started to go up to these conferences and connect with people. And again, it's about the people that want you to connect because there's tons of educational opportunities out there and virtual trainings and, uh, and in-person trainings. But the people involved with the NiceGate organization really make it uh, not just about learning and growth because you can get that a lot of places, but they make it feel personal that you're part of the, the family and that you're welcome, uh, which I really can appreciate. So I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's that I just can't um, keep keep out of things sometimes, but I, I, I saw opportunity. I had heard a call probably about volunteering with NiceGate from um, one of the events I was at. And I said, you know, I just emailed after one of the events and I said, what can I do to step up and sort of be involved? And so I started to volunteer as well on, the, on the social media team and that team has evolved over the years. It's gotten a little bit bigger as social media has become more uh, prevalent and intense as well. Uh, we also have an outreach committee that, that sort of dovetails with social media as well. Um, and we also partner even with our corporate council of people who are our sub supporters, financial supporters of our organization as well. 
So it's, it's kind of interesting to be involved and to sort of see that mesh together of all those different avenues. Um, in the meantime, I had to do some training though, because, and I tell students this all the time too, when they're trying to brand themselves or market themselves, you know, it's just because you have a Twitter doesn't mean you're good at it <laughs> or that, you know? And so these students sure. are like, I'm going to be a social media marketer for a business. I'm like, no, you're not like, what are you going to do? So I actually did some training, um, interestingly with, um, Hootsuite. It's a, an app. I'm not paid mm -hmm. by them. I'm not trying to support in any way like that, but um, they offered a training of uh, social media marketing coordinator. And uh, I took that course. Um, it was really interesting. And it wasn't just Twitter. It was uh, all kinds of social networks and stuff. Um, but we really focus on a couple of things. And it's engagement with our, our community because there's websites. There's lots of places to get static information. But uh, we're big fans. And Mark Joffrey, who's my partner in, in the social media for NiceGate, is um, really like uh, awesome about connecting with people and, and contests and stuff. I mean, it, it costs us pennies to offer a contest to say, uh, as an organization, hey, um, post a picture of your favorite event or post a, a comment about something and we're gonna choose one winner and give you a $5 Starbucks gift card. I mean, it's virtual. We just emailed the link to them. It's not even like they need mm -hmm. a card, but like some of that buy-in of just like hooking you in giveaways, everyone loves their swag at conferences and stuff. Sure. But just connecting people with those little things like that um, are really cool uh, ways to continue engagement. Um, and so that's really fun. Um, we have a great team of volunteers who work with us um, from all different avenues, the librarian and the college uh, professor and like um, someone who works at FOCES. We have a team of folks who work with us um, in the social media. So it's not just us, not just me and Mark running things. Um, but that's really cool. And it, what's neat to see also is the behind the scenes a little bit about what's going on in the organization and working with uh, Sean McDonough and Amy, Amy Del Corvo. So um, that's been really neat to, to see some of that stuff. What's really exciting with that organization, though, is the, the push uh, started a year or so ago to start working with um, regional meetups. Uh, we're a big state with lots of geography to travel if you're trying to get together with people. Um, so they're, they're really working towards regional meetups. And I think a couple of regions have, regions have done one or two. Um, it, they're great when they can be at establishments with, uh, you know, some refreshments, uh, if we could do that <laughs> instead of having our online component only, uh, but certainly some neat ways to connect and collaborate and, uh, with our local friends as well. And that everyone needs their people. I've got an incredible text message group, you know, group text that happens from all sorts of tech leaders in my region that are blown up all day. Are you seeing this problem? Are you guys doing this? What are you doing about this situation? So to build that out as part of a network and have our support. Um, of teachers, not just tech leaders, but of, of classroom teachers and people who can engage through, through NiceGate um, would be really cool. So I'm excited to see what the future holds there. Have you checked out Clubhouse or Discord? Those seem to be Yeah, for, for the group texting and stuff, for the messaging. We haven't moved in that direction yet, uh, which is uh, would be good if I did, because in my office, I get no self. I have zero bars. <laughs> so uh, anyone, since I have an Android thrown in there and my iPhone, it's like, you know, they don't connect right through all the way. So sometimes I leave work and it's 75 text messages blow up. But, uh, it's all right, because sometimes you need, do need to tune out your people, but it's nice to be there when we can be there for each other too. All right. Well, I had a few extra questions to go through here, but I think we've kind of hit on most of the topics I wanted to. So let's let's dig into a few Speed Geek questions. So these are uh, quick, uh, short answers, and uh, we'll, we'll go with a, a few of them here. So we'll start with uh, oh, this is this is the uh, your generation question. It's name your first storage device. Oh, like for uh, digital media. Oh um, yeah, like did you use a thumb drive, floppy oh, yeah, disk? Definitely. Oh, that's right. Well, so uh, I mean, I I love I did have a computer um, with the large floppy disks. I do remember that in my home growing up. So that would be at the <laughs> eight was it eight inches or something like that? A seven yeah. inch <laughs> floppy disk, and then you had to put in a series of them to load programs because it couldn't hold enough data for the program. <laughs> Uh, but I did, I did start my coding journey. It's actually interesting. My coding journey started in elementary school at an Apple IIe computer where you had to code the little turtle and make it do things. They called it the turtle, I guess, in my school. I don't know what it was actually called, but you had to run code. And it was fascinating because I was in elementary school. So that was probably in the, I don't know, early 90s, mid 90s. And um, yeah, early 90s, we're doing coding on an Apple IIe computer. And then nobody talked about coding until like five years ago in schools. It was like crazy, right? So we went from right. creation to consumption 
back to creation. And so I think that journey is very interesting because that's of course a better place to be if we're creating instead of just consuming content. Um, but anyway, that I keep ranting on stuff. You said yeah, I know. Stuff. It's good. Um, all right, what's your favorite app? Oh, that's a tough one because it, I guess it rotates here and there. But um, if we opened your phone and looked at what the the data, <laughs> the yeah, data, the data use, probably. <laughs> uh, I guess it depends workday, weekday, that kind of thing too. But probably Instagram. I, I, I'm just I'm on the gram a lot. Nice, nice. That that is a good one. It's nice and light and and just interest. You know, you want yep. to see something, you want to get check something out, you just browse. There it is. So, all right, and. We'll go with this one as our last one. What's your favorite tablet? Well, um, I we do have a couple of iPads in the house, but um, I don't actually- Tablet's kind of becoming a dated word, isn't it? It is. You're not um, hearing I it so much. had a little seven inch Samsung tablet that was, that was uh, probably, I don't know, it's probably eight or nine years old and it's just a workhorse right now. I, I one time slid it in my pocket and sat on it. So I broke the screen, but- um, I was able to replace the screen and it's just a powerful workhorse. So it just keeps going and um, we can run apps and fly drones and do all kinds of stuff on it. And it's, it doesn't seem to have the data, the, the update issue that sometimes becomes obsolete with some other tablet companies. Cool. Well, it's great catching up and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at NiceGate. Hopefully we can get back and be in person and. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, we all want it and crave it, right? This is what yeah. we are as people. So yeah, um, we're all itching for that. That'd be great. All right. We'll keep up the great work, John. Great catching up, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Andy. Take care. Bye.